Hey, Lord, and we invite your presence now. These, the altar is open, the aisles are open. Just feel free to worship the Lord. Let's continue on.
stop running. And as you give it to him, he's made it real simple for you. He just wants you to do what we've been doing right here, to give him praise, to allow his presence to come into your home, to come into your job, to come into your car. And God says, I'm going to do a quick work of deliverance for you, and I'm going to break every chain so that you're going to arrive on time. Remember, it's been said that we're moving right into September, and we're going to start to see things breaking out. So we're going to give the Lord one more shout, one more clap of praise, and we're going to seal the big work that he's begun so that we can transition on to the next place of this service and on to the next place of our new. All right, go ahead and lead us in one more shout. team thank you church for inviting his presence in you may be seated I think we're getting the atmosphere ready to hear the word of the Lord getting our hearts ready we're so glad that each of you are here today we're so glad those joining in on the internet are here with us today we hope that you'll stay with us and participate all the way through pray for us and just experience the presence of God that's here today. I know that there's always first-time visitors here today. We've got some from our family. There's, I know that there's others. If you're with us for the very first time, you're our special guest on behalf of Dr. Buddy and Dr. Mary Crum, who are away on vacation, and all of our leadership and church family here. You're our guest. We want to recognize you and welcome you. If you just lift your hand, if you're in the sanctuary today for the very first time here, I know there's some over there. Where else? Where else we got? Life Center, let's reach out to each other take a moment say hello tell your neighbor they're looking good today visitors there's a guest registration card in the seat pocket in front of you we'd love to have a record of your visit if you just fill it out and uh, save that because at the end of the service we're going to make an opportunity available to you to come to the visitor welcome center if you would like it's right outside this door here and we'd just answer any questions that you have just make sure you know that we appreciate you being here and uh, just give you a chance to, to ask meet any of our leadership team so save that card there's a prayer request space provided on the back if you have a certain prayer request you'd like to get prayed over you can write it there as well amen all right well we're going to continue on now with the obedience of giving our tithes and our offerings to the lord and we've got envelopes in the seat pocket in front of you that'll help you do that there's a white envelope in that envelope. You can give a check in that envelope. Make it out to Life Center Ministries. Life Center Ministries. You can also place cash in that envelope. And you can give by credit card as well. So you can get all in that white envelope. Also, you can um, 
look on the home page at lifecenter.org if you're if you've tuned in today there's a place provided for you to give through paypal or other ways of giving as well you can download our app how do we download that app there we go you can download our app by texting life center ga to 77977 text life center ga to 77977 download that church app and you can download you can donate there again you can also download at lifecenter.org amen are we ready to give our tithes and our offerings and pray and believe god over our offering hallelujah Hallelujah. Father, we thank you that you are our supplier. Lord, we thank you that there's more than enough in your kingdom, that you supply every need according to your riches and glory. Lord, you open the windows of heaven. And Father, we thank you that as we're obedient to give our tithes and as we give our offerings with a cheerful heart, Lord, that you rebuke the devourer on our behalf. I pray, Lord, that you would begin to rebuke the devourer on, on our behalf, that you would break the chains of debt, that you would break the chains of lack and poverty. We come against it now as a church body and we declare freedom from those chains in this season we declare the windows of heaven open and an abundance coming in favor being upon your church now lord we release that and bless this offering now as we serve the congregation
at this time, I want you to pull out your pen and your paper and your phones. We're going to get ready to your calendars and take a look at all that's going on here at Life Center and see what's in these announcements for you.
All right, hallelujah. Well, before we dismiss our children and bring our speaker up, we're going to declare Amos 9 together. It's been prophesied and confirmed by our senior leadership that we've only got a few more weeks on this, maybe five or six, and then we're going to seal that and start to see things happen, and some are already seeing that happen. Come on, we're, we're on the home stretch, so let's declare it like we mean it. Amen. All right, all together now. Yes, indeed, it won't be long now, God's decree. Things are going to happen so fast your head will swim. One thing fast on the heels of the other. You won't be able to keep up. Everything will be happening at once, and everywhere you look, blessings. Blessings like wine pouring off the mountains and hills. I'll make everything right again for my people Israel. They'll rebuild the ruined cities. They'll plant vineyards and drink good wine. They'll work their gardens and eat fresh vegetables, and I'll plant them, plant them on their own land. They'll never again be uprooted from the land I've given them. God, your God says so. Hallelujah. All right, you may be seated. And we're going to dismiss our children at this time. We do have child care provided for those visiting and for members. Uh, that's one through three, ages one through three in the nursery. That's going to be right here on this level. The nursery is going to be found on this side of the, of the foyer. And then we also have pre-K and kindergartners, our first grade, pre-K through first, upstairs. And that's in room 206. There's stairwells on each side. It's going to be upstairs on this side of, that, of the second level. And then we have second grade through fifth grade on this side of the second level, also up the stairs. And that's second grade through fifth grade. And then we have our youth, which is going to be on the lower level. You can access the stairwell to get there on this side. Just walk out down the hall, go down. That's ages sixth grade through 12th grade. That's our forest youth, ages sixth grade through 12th grade. So you may take your child now. Please go and check them in. And get right on back because I have the privilege now of introducing our speaker for today. How many of you were here a couple weeks ago? All right. Then you know who I'm talking about. I'm sure we'll get a little bit of continuation of that. Plus also what the Holy Spirit wants to say. But today we're going to be able to hear from our very own Pastor Samuel Giles. I know that he's fired up and well prepared. He walks in a strong prophetic mantle, and uh, he has a heart to see uh, the purity of the Lord. He has a heart to see us find our call and get there and get there on time, and that's the kind of year that we're in right now. So get out your pen and paper or your phones or whatever you take notes with and get ready to receive what the Lord has. Come on up, Pastor Samuel. We love you and welcome you to the pulpit. While you're at it, go ahead and give God glory. Yeah. Worship the name of Jesus. He is high and lifted up. Amen. We bless his holy and righteous name. It is a privilege and an honor to be back before you to have uh, the benefit of following up after Dr. Hope. How many people were blessed by the message last week and the move of God that swept through this place? We honor the Lord for all of the gifts that have been here, who have been blessed the whole month of July. From Elder Blake, the messages, amen. God is faithful unto us. We celebrate our senior leaders, Apostle Buddy and Dr. Mary Crum, in their absence, amen. As they're wrapping up their vacation, we believe that they're coming back full of the word of God for our direction and where we need to go in the future, amen? Amen. And lastly, but definitely not least, my sweetheart, Pastor Ayanna Giles, I thank God for her. Amen. Now that the formalities are out of the way, a couple of weeks ago we started a message called Set Apart, Where Are the Priests? How many people remember that? Amen? Hallelujah. We're going to continue kind of that thought pattern, Set Apart Part 2, The Law of Ascension. Amen? So if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2, beginning at verse 1 through 7. We're going to read through that and then add to what the Lord has to say for us today. Amen. Thank you, Lord. 
And it reads, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things saying, he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars. And you have perverted, or perverse, or persevered, sorry, scratch that. You have persevered and have patience <laughs> and labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which also hate, which also I hate, I'm sorry. <clears throat> he who uh, has an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit of the Lord says to the church and to him who overcomes, I will give to him to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise, paradise of God. Amen. I want to go back to this one topic, remember from how far you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. As the body of Christ is building towards what God is doing in the midst of this apostolic, apostolic reformation and God is shifting the whole body of Christ and bringing change and transformation to his body, many of us as forerunners, those churches and houses that are called to be apostolic sinners that have been on the forefront and the thrust, sometimes the, the thing that the enemy does is bait us into the place of being in norms and ruts. And I heard the Lord say that he's coming to break every systematic norm and to break us out of every single rut that we don't miss the nuances that's going to make us great in this season. Amen. We're in the age where the fivefold is being accepted and ushered back into the fullness of the church. And it's absolutely amazing for what it needs to do to the body of Christ according to the word of God. But in many cases, we see where the enemy is trying to sow seeds to get us to poke, put our focus in a direction that we have no business looking in, in the sense that we've set our gaze and our focus and our target on something that the Lord never meant for us to set our target on. In many cases, it's stirring us to a place where we're looking at uh, there becoming a trap where we're putting more focus on how our gifts function than the intimacy that we have with the Father who is the one who gave the gifts. And so God is dealing with us right where we are, especially concerning houses that are training houses because when we are training centers, what happens is that those who come in, who ne that they don't necessarily have the framework or the fabric of what's been here for a long time. They're being introduced to a culture that they don't have a language to really understand. So what they're seeing is gifts functioning and operating, but not knowing the background that had to bring the people into the ability for them to function wholeheartedly in these gifts. Now hear me, I want to make this disclaimer in the forefront before y'all start throwing daggers and, and, and all kind of stuff at me. Amen. I absolutely believe wholeheartedly in the mandate of this house to train and equip the saints for the work of the ministry that anybody that is saved can hear the voice of God. Amen. I believe it wholeheartedly that every person could come in this building. I've seen it too many times by the mandate of what's on Dr. Mary's life. They walk in this door and they could be saved 15 minutes. And within another 15 minutes, they are speaking in tongues and prophesying. Why? It's the will of the Lord. It's the desire of God for him to actually have an ear with his people. But what he does not want is there to be imbalance in the development of his people. Amen. He is a God that wants every single one of us to be super nutritious in the midst of our daily diet and how we feast and know and operate and understand the fullness of who he is. Amen. So as we're in this age, we're seeing the, the two cultures begin to shift as tectonic plates. As the previous culture that was before us, we had a lot of people that were superstar celebrity preachers. We had a lot of people that were in the forefront on TV and all kind of other things. And it became almost uh, 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 synonymous with being able to prophesy that you had a card that said that you were a prophet. 
Amen. People were running to places, getting trained, wanting to hear the voice of the Lord, wanting to move in these different signs and wonders and then run out and start their ministry immediately, not having the framework or the foundation to build them strongly in the things of God. Our, our covering, literally, for, for this house, this movement, for what God has created, he has something called the 10 M's. And there's a 10 M's of a minister, of a mature minister. And it, it literally deals with every aspect of a man that God will actually mature the man before he actually makes the minister. And we have spent too much time, and when I say we, I'm talking about the body at large, universal, too much time building people's ministry before we've dealt with character, before we've dealt with integrity, before we've dealt with their heart towards the things of God, before we've removed every single thing that they could have been bought by, and we're setting people up for failure because we're allowing their hearts to remain unhindered concerning the heart of God yearning and pulling them into the place of submission. And I know submission is a cuss word to so many, amen, but it is the actual thing that requires you to be able to say that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. He cannot be Lord if you won't surrender. Hallelujah. It can't be worship if you refuse to bow. Amen. So we're going to deal with this thing today so we can get to the fullness of what it is because we cannot fully understand the mind of God unless the Spirit of God downloads how we are to process and understand the system of how God wants us to function and operate for the age that we've been called to. Amen. Every move of God, every age of God has a different anointing, has different tactics, has different schematics and blueprints that are, be, uh, to, that are to be ushered out in order for the full wave of God to happen. If we try to do it according to old patterns, we will mess up what God wants to do, and we will sit back and watch the wave pass us by. Amen? So God is bringing us into a place of connecting the dots. Today we're connecting the dots of how a priestly heart leads us into a place that we can actually function in the law of ascension. We spend too much time in low places congregating with things that are beneath what God has spoken us to be and what he has said for us to operate in. And literally, he said to us, set your mind, what, above, on things above. But we spend 90% of our times on things that are here in the earth. Amen. And when the Bible says that the affairs or the cares of this life will come and snatch the seeds that God's trying to plant in our hearts if we allow it and it's being done by our inability to quiet the voice and the chatter of the day to be able to ascend to a place where we're ready to hear the voice of God. So it's in that exchange where the mentality has been broken in us that we have not had the ability to wrestle with God until we see change and transformation. There has been a weakening of the will of man to hold fast to God until change comes. See, back in the day when there was nothing left, when they had no luxuries and they had no uh, ability to run to the doctor, they had no ability to drive down the street and find what they need, they couldn't go to CVS, they couldn't go to places, what they found was a deep heart and trust saying, God, your word says, this is what you're going to do according to your word. I'm going to ask you over and over again, and I'm going to be like the woman that wears you out until you respond on my behalf. See, the law of ascension means that you blank out on everything that is carnal. And you begin to ascend the hill of the Lord so that you're able to stand in his holy place. So we're in a place where God is allowing for many of us the river to dry up. Uh-oh. Amen. He's allowing the comfort zone to get dry for a minute so that there is a hunger of a pursuit. And we're starting to pick up books that we haven't picked up in a while. We're starting to find ourselves looking for conferences that's going to minister to the place in our heart that we feel like there's a void. We're finding a hunger and a drive that's pushing us, that's saying, I will not be denied because my heart is thirsty and I'm crying out for the living God and I will not stop until I drink. It's the difference in what will cause you to be able to ride the wave of glory as opposed to sitting back as a spectator and watching it pass over you and you not being able to participate at the level. Understand that God wants to catch all of us up at the same time. Understand that the scripture says that he will what? Redeem the time on your behalf. So when we approach 
encountering God as priest, what God does is he begins to change things. We begin to minister to him. We talked about that uh, a couple of weeks ago. But the thing that I love, the heart of the priest, he begins to cry out and say, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me. And see, when we begin to look at our lives from the, from the framework and the standpoint of, is this connected to the will of why he sent me? Everything begins to get a little uh, testy and, and a little shaken and, a, and a, that, 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 that winnowing fork of the Lord and the, the blade of God begins to prune the things that we're putting our attention on and begins to align our lives in a way that we have a focus that we haven't seen before. See, this priestly anointing, it's what matures you so that you can step into sonship. I had a conversation with one of my, our elders that is one of my greatest, greatest, greatest hearts, and Pastor Ayana as well. And in the midst of our conversation, this, this, this ministry time came up about what the Lord had to say. And in the body of Christ, we've thrown that term son out as if it's equivalent to child of God. But that's not what the scripture says. The scripture tells us that we are children of God but it says, as those who are led by the Spirit of God, it is them that are, have the power to what? Become the sons of God. Meaning that this is a process and a journey of maturation that has to be born out of a place of a person that says, I submit and I surrender to what God is doing in me. We throw things, and I get it, because we, it's our protocol. When we prophesy to each other, it's son or daughter. And it's supposed to be that way. Why? Because God is prophesying to you from your future. He's prophesying to you from the place that you have not developed into yet. And he's decreeing over you the language that you need to understand in order to begin to take the steps that will lead you forward into that process. And so the son is speaking to the place in you that is yet still as a child that needs to come into heirship and the place that you go from heirship into being joint heirs with Jesus Christ so that you can walk in the fullness of what sonship looked like. The thing of what God is doing is that he's bringing us to a place where we're f having to figure out, okay, Lord, what's really in our hearts? And the Lord beat me all night long. To the point where I was like, okay, Lord, I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to take every single thing. And I told John, one of our members, I saw him yesterday while I was doing some work on my car, what the Lord woke me up with yesterday morning. And he said, rejoice when strong rebuke comes because it's the device that I'm using to break up your stony heart so that when I plant the seeds of your future, you're able to receive it. And I said, okay, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> Where are we going with God? But I begin to just meditate on that thing throughout the day. And the harsh rebukes come to shake us. To hit the hard place in our hearts that is yet still holding on to something that says, okay, God, but I want to go, but I don't know. I want to yield, but uh, I want to say yes, but uh. And God is like, no, I need all of it. I need every single piece of your heart. I need every single piece of your, your future. I need every single piece of your past. Give me every thought and every ambition because I need to try it. This is the power in it. Because without your ambitions being tried, there's still a place where the enemy can creep in and your selfish ambition can become something that totally derobes, unends, destroys, tears down the fullness of God's plan for your life. John 3, 14 through 17 says, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but it is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, then gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. See, for many of us, the need for validation, the need for acceptance, the need for actually being successful in a thing has drawn us into looking for it to be fulfilled in the functionality of what God has called us to be within the four walls of the church. And it's kept us in a place where we have been incubated, for lack of a better term, 
because many of us have been here with the doors waiting for us to run towards healing and we have chose to sit back and say, yeah, I'll get to that next year. That healing and deliverance session, yeah, God, I know you've been tearing at my heart and tugging at my heart, but, eh, you know, I don't know them people. I don't want nobody looking at me crazy. Amen. <laughs> I'm looking at several faces that I know exactly that that's what they said. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but the danger is, is that all of this is spreading throughout the body of Christ. And it's causing church growth and spiritual development to take on an off-kilter perspective. And God's people are suffering in the wings of what is supposedly successful growth. But then they get to the place where the gifts are functioning and they have the actual accusation that the enemy is speaking over them saying, aren't you the ones that have prophesied in his name, that have healed the sick in his name, that has cast out demons in his name, but how close is your heart to him? Is there yet still iniquity working in the deep recesses of your soul? And the danger is, is that we will end up, as scripture says, being in a place that if we don't stop this thing dead in its tracks and say, you know what, God, you are the preeminent thing. You are my prize. You are my exceeding great reward. And we begin to train people from that standpoint that the very depths of every gift that you function in is born out of a heartbeat of love towards the one who is the creator of the gift. It will actually cause your gift to function at a level that you have never seen before in your life. I know, I know it's hard and it's tight right now. But hear me, God is trying to get us to a place where our perspectives change. When the, when the preeminent thing becomes love, now you become a minister unto God. A lot of us, we focused on being ministers of God, but when you become a minister unto God, he takes delight in everything that you do. All of a sudden, it changes everything. Because what is the righteous cause that you're picking up for God? Guess what he does? He picks up your just cause. And he begins to war to make sure every single thing that he has spoken concerning your life comes to pass. This is what I want to get to. The definition for a son of God. If I ask this question in the audience, we would probably have as many different definitions as we have people in this room. I pulled a couple of together from a couple of concordances. But Strong's had the very, you know, funny, the strongest one. Amen. Amen. <laughs> that really had the meat that was there for me. And it says, sons of God are those who revere God as their father, the pious worshipers of God, those who in character and in life resemble God, those who are governed by the spirit of God, who repose the same calm and joyful trust in God, which children do their parents. And hereafter in the blessedness of the glory of the life eternal will openly wear the, this dignity of sons of God. It is a term that preeminently spoke of Jesus Christ as the only son of God, only begotten son of God, I'm sorry, as enjoying the supreme love of God united to him in affectionate intimacy, privy to his saving counsels. Hear that. There are multiple counsels that deal with salvation for us. When the Bible talks about councils in heaven, that is the place where the governance of God or the governance of the kingdom of God begins to manifest. Everybody doesn't get access to councils. You might get access to the mind of God. You might get access absolutely to the mercy seat. But when it comes to a place where you begin to reckon with God face to face, he does it only with friends. Oh, oh, oh. He does it only with those who have spent a, a place of time of allowing their hearts to be completely captivated by his face, by his presence, by his anointing, by his grace, by his glory, that when he looks at them, he sees himself. So he actually likes to share his secrets with friends. Abraham was a friend of God that he shared his secrets with. Should I hide from my servant Abraham since he's going to be a mighty nation what it is I'm about to do to Sodom and Gomorrah? And in that question, he actually opened a space of access for Abraham to come and have counsel with the Lord. That God actually shifted his whole agenda based on the words that came out of his mouth. 
that if I could find a delegation of 10 in the midst of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, I will not destroy it, but I will change my whole agenda if I find a righteous group that can actually represent the council, that can actually represent sons of God as an ecclesia sitting in the midst of this city. Strong stuff. But he said, obedient to his father's will in all acts, proclaiming his messiahship and also designating him as the head of the human family, the man, the one who furnished, both furnished the pattern of the perfect man and acted on the behalf of all mankind in order for that pattern to be walked out. See, a lot of times we forget that God does everything according to templates. From the very beginning, we have the framework of looking at how God made man in his image, after his image and his likeness, that God was the template for man. And then in the point when it comes to worship, that the access point for God and man to actually reconcile relationship and come back together was the tabernacle. It was the outer court, the inner court, and the holy of holies. I heard a, a message by Benny Hinn when he said, when you heard Jesus say that I am the way, the truth, and the life, he was re referencing the temple. And he was saying in Hebrew, when you look at it, it actually means the gate, the door, and the veil. So when he says that I'm the way, the truth, and the life, he's saying that I am the gate, I am the door, and I am the veil. I love it because scripture follows it up and it says that actually in Hebrews, his flesh, his body was the veil that we came into the new covenant through and that he actually was the, the gateway, the vantage point, the access point that we entered into the place of having complete rec reconciled relationship between God and man and the fullness of what God intended in the very garden. So the true weight that we have to understand that comes upon us and how we look at our development and where we are with God is not about how your gift is functioning. Because the Bible says that gifts and callings come without what? Repentance. But it's your ability to ascend the hill of the Lord that actually dictates how much authority you have in the realm of the spirit and how much you're moving heaven and earth when you open your mouth. It's whether or not the enemy has anything in common with you when it comes to the very thing that you're beginning to speak towards. Amen. That's why we have to what in deliverance? Clear the legal ground so that we can actually bind the strong man and spoil his goods. But it takes a place where we have discipline concerning our own walk with God, and we cannot be lazy and lackadaisical in any way, shape, form, or fashion. And hear me, I'm talking to myself as much as I'm preaching to anybody in this place. It's dealing with the heart matters because God is trying to actually make us ready to live in this place of the ascended place at all times. Psalm 24 says, The earth of the Lord is in the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. For he had founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. And he said, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He that have clean heart, clean hands and a pure heart, who have not lifted up his soul unto vanity, killing pride, who have not sworn deceitfully, killing that spirit of deception and that lying tongue. But he shall receive the blessing of the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. And then this is where that thing shifted. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. But didn't Jesus say that he was a gate? Hmm. How did he come through the place of a gate? What happened at the entry point of the temple? It was the place where the priests offered sacrifices. But what did God say to us? Present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So you enter in and become a gate for the king of glory to come in as you function in your priestly duty as a son. We're going to connect all of these dots so that we can see the fullness of what God wants to say. Be ye lifted up, you everlasting doors, that the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord God, what? Mighty in battle. See, when we're clean before him, we end up on the right side so that we don't end up catching blows by the heavenly hosts that come in to do battle with that which is not like God. Anybody heard the term friendly fire? Anybody actually stepped into a moment where you went to go minister to somebody else and then God whooped your behind in the midst of your ministry to them? That the word ended up being more for you than it was for the person that you were giving it to? 
Amen. That's friendly fire. That's when the Lord literally starts whooping you across your backside, saying, listen, no, I need you to get this. Because there's a blinder that's there that's saying, son, you saying you're good, but I'm looking at you. And I see what's functioning behind the veil. I see what's functioning behind the walls. I see what's functioning behind the emotion and behind the facade and behind the clothes and behind the name brands and the designer brands and behind all the things that you're saying as Christianese, I'm blessed and I'm highly favored and I'm going through all the antics knowing that in the depths of your soul there's something that's crying out for the healing virtue of the living God. Ascension deals with maturity because it deals with your ability to untether yourself from everything that is of this world. Now, we're not talking off and crazy because the folks will take this and cut it up and say, oh, they're a cult over there. They want you living on, on Life Center's compound and all this other stuff. No, no, amen. No, we're not doing that. <laughs> no. But we do want you to be what? Set apart. Scripture tells us that if we're holy, we're set apart, what? Unto God. So the priesthood comes in a place where it begins to proclaim to a generation that you have an access point or you are a catalyst and a gateway for the king of glory to minister at the level that he desires. That if God can't find nobody else, he should be able to find the members of the life center. If, if catastrophe was about to hit Atlanta, there should be at least 10 found in the body that's in a place where we can hear the voice of God and begin to cry out, mercy, 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 mer have mercy over the city, have mercy over this country, have mercy over these people. And we see the hand of God move. Why? Because he's obligated. Because sons have shown up. Hear me. There is a thing that's differentiating the people in the body of Christ that we've allowed ourselves to get stuck at the door. We get stuck at salvation and we stay there and we just run in place for a minute. I'm learning, I'm growing. Yeah, but you're not moving anywhere. <laughs> Hear me, yeah, I want you saved. I want you growing in the knowledge of God, but guess what, he even rebuked a whole church of people to say, I should be feeding you meat now, but you need the very entry, elementary points of the word. You're still on milk. Grow up. I know it's a hard word for a lot of people, but hear me. I'm not just saying this to everybody. I'm preaching to me. This is saying to Pastor Samuel Giles, grow up. There's some areas that you need to come up higher. There's a whole nother level of understanding that I need to bring you into. And if you stay here at what you were at for the last six months, if you stay where you've been for the last year, if you stay where you've been for the last two years, you're going to miss what it is that I'm doing because the level of comprehension that I need to bring you to needs to be higher than the wounds. It needs to be higher than the emotion. It needs to be higher than the thought process. It needs to be higher than comparison. It needs to be higher than the thoughts of men. It needs to be higher than the fear of man. It needs to be higher than the appearance of man. It needs to be above everything else so that I can bring you into the place that you govern with me. That's what God wants to do for every single person that will get on this journey into sonship. Amen? He literally promised, they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, what? Shall be filled. It is a place where God is trying to craft in us the heartbeat and the language of tomorrow so that we're able to steward over it and guess what? Bring in an entire harvest that is supposed to be where we was, where, right where we're at walking in the things of God. I want to read to you Ephesians 4.9, starting there and going through verse 15 because I know y'all were like, okay, Pastor Samuel is completely against fivefold. He's talking crazy. What's going on with this man of God? Hear me, when I said to y'all two weeks ago that the fivefold is absolutely paramount, it's God's idea, we need the fivefold functioning and operating within the body of Christ in order to get where we're supposed to get. The fivefold in and of itself were five aspects of Jesus that was released into the earth so that we could, what, grow into conformity of looking like him. But it was not supposed to be the end all be all. And we got too many people setting their eyes on being a fivefold minister as opposed to being a mature son. 
and God is coming after every idol that we've set up, looking at somebody else's success, looking at somebody else's title, looking at somebody else's position, and saying, that's where I got to go. Hear me, everybody is not going to be a fivefold minister. Everybody is not going to be called into that place of responsibility. And for many of you, you don't want to be. Because you're not fashioned for it. And it will drive you absolutely mad. Why? Because the warfare that's at the level of what that office and what that place and that position requires is far beyond anything that you've ever comprehended before. But it does not make you less in the body. Sonship is the greatest term that could ever be spoken over a son or a daughter. Why? Because you get inheritance. He gave us the spirit of adoption by which we cry, Abba, Father. But if we never step into that place where we start manifesting what Father really looks like, we sit there and we fight against the voice that we've been crying out for our whole lives. It's preaching at Anwar Atlanta here on Friday night with the men. And in the room, there was nothing, I mean, I mean, so many father wounds that were in the room. And the Lord had me dealing with the voice of a silent father. When righteousness goes wrong, the cry of broken sons. Many of us, we don't know how to hear and receive. We hear, but we don't receive the voice of the father because we're still holding on to stuff that's connected to our earthly fathers. We still got stuff that's undealt with and unprocessed, and part of our maturation is actually saying, you know what, that's the issue. And it's holding me back. I've been upset with my dad. I've been upset with the fact that, God, you let my dad leave. I'm upset with the fact that I was abused. I'm upset with the fact that I took this pain. And you have stuffed it, and you've made it in a place where I'm going to get over I'm just going to walk on and I'm going to, it's going to be all right. It'll, it'll be all over in the morning. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy is going to come in the morning. Guess what? You're going to go to sleep and that wound is going to be sitting right there until you give it the attention that is needed where God could actually come in and begin to dig that root of wickedness and bitterness and that wound of trauma and that wound of pain and deal with the judgments and the vows and all the things that were spoken to bring that thing to pass. But it says... I'll start actually at verse 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So what did Jesus himself do? He ascended. Amen? Now this, he ascended, what does it mean that he also first descended into the lower depths of the earth? That death process. He who descended is also the one that ascended far above, far above the heavens, and that he might fail all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of itself, of the body of Christ itself together. Until we all come into the fullness of the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. To what? A perfect man. Who was the perfect man? Y'all a little quiet. Jesus. Jesus was the perfect man. So that means until we come into the full conformity of the Son of God, that we are going to need fivefold. That's Bible. But the fallacy is that we won't come into the fullness of the Son of God until we go to glory. No. No. I, this is my personal belief. If you can find it in Scripture and argue me down, then we can go to Scripture and we can find it. But I found too many apostles saying, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus, which is the full manifestation. Paul himself said, I want to manifest this thing, the fullness of Jesus Christ, hopefully in this tent. Meaning that in this body, I actually want to manifest the fullness of Jesus and walk as he walked, talk as he talked, deliver as he delivered, minister as he ministered, cry out as he cried out, and do the will of the Father until the glory of God is manifested in the earth. It shouldn't just be the cry of the fathers of old. 
but it should be the cries of the sons of now that say, Lord, whatever you need to deal with, I'm going to deal with every single bloodline issue going all the way back to Adam. Whatever I need to search out, whatever I need to dig out, I don't care what technology I need to learn. I don't even care what kind of discipline I need to go through. But Lord, I'm going to stay on this altar and I'm going to continue to seek until there's nothing in my bloodline anymore, until I am truly the redeemer of my bloodline. And all the way back to Adam, there is redemption. There is the place that I've torn down every demonic altar, where I've dealt with every con place of covenant and connection where people in my bloodline have made an alignment with the things of the enemy. I'm going to press until there's nothing but Jesus manifested. That's what he's calling us into. God is coming for every bit of it. Five folk ministry officers were called ascension gifts for a reason. Why? They were supposed to come into connection with God to so much so that they would be completely transformed so that the actual template that is being reproduced is of one that is becoming a mature son. Too many times we see the gift functioning, the ability functioning, and we say, yeah, it's strong, it's mighty. But behind the scenes, there's still a place where that person is wavering on whether or not they're going to love Jesus with everything they got. There's still this teeter-totter in the midst of their heart where double-mindedness is trying to creep in and rob them of their sanity and their ability to trust the Lord for everything. Yes, we will all go through trials and tribulations. The Bible actually says rejoice when they come. Why? Because it's fashioning in you the person of Jesus as you go through trials and tribulations and it's making you ready. It's perfecting the Lord Jesus Christ on the inside of you. God is dealing with arrested development because we've had our, our growth stunted because our eyes are being put on something that has been off kilter. I, I mean, literally, we counsel people from other churches sometimes that literally are in a place where they can prophesy your face blue and be accurate, but still in a place where they want to put a bullet in their mouths. I've been to places where I had to drive in the middle of the day and run in my car 100 miles an hour down the highway to make sure I get to a person's house to knock on their door so that they hear the voice of God crying out to them saying, don't do it. Still too much purpose in your life. Still too much destiny locked inside of you. We will not allow the enemy to destroy you in the midst of this broken state. But when the gift gets highlighted more than the person, we miss the fact that what did the Lord say last time I preached? That souls was the most important commodity unto him. And we miss the soul that's broken because we see the glory of the gift. Not realizing they're a broken cistern. Because as much as they tap into the glory of God and God pours, it leaks right out of them when they go home. Because the broken framework that's there of their soul still being as Swiss cheese with holes all in it, they still don't have the ability to hold fast to the healing that God wants to be. So we need those who come as soul care. Disciplers, pastors, amen, elders. Believers, the Bible says they that are spiritual restore. So your maturation has to grow you in your spirituality to bring you into a place where you can mature people and restore them that they are fine fallen. Many of us are stagnant in where we are because as you behold a thing, that's what you become. When you look and you focus on a thing, that's why Jesus, I mean, the God the Father made sure that Adam, as he looked at him, beheld the fullness of the face of God in his glory. There was no veiling, there was no holding back. Adam saw God in the full manifestation of his glory. Why? Because I need you to behold what you're going to be. So did you get the language, the understanding for everything you're supposed to walk in? Now imagine if we started in the body, raising up people where we're focused on nothing, but training people in the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, of how to be perfected in Jesus Christ, of how to have the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ, that from the age of four and five, we actually make sure that they grow in stature and favor with both God and man. <laughs> Scandals would cease. Churches would be founded on the preeminence of Jesus Christ and him alone. 
the focus will be solely on one kingdom, not people building their own in the midst of the church and slowing down the advancement of what God wants to do. This thing is absolutely critical to what God wants to do to advance his agenda to make sure that the fullness of the fivefold manifests in the individual life of the person that encounters them. Why? Because the functionality of the fivefold is supposed to have fruit from it. Gone is the day of having evangelists on your name and you ain't won nobody to Jesus in the last year. Gone is the day that you're only prophesying, but there is nothing that you could steward over the shifted atmosphere to make sure a life is completely restored to the will of God and the scroll of what is written in his book. Gone is the day that you call yourself a pastor, but you're cussing folks out. You as evil as can be with bitterness in your heart, but you're saying that you're the one that's supposed to be the mender of the brokenhearted. Gone is the day that you have apostolic mandates and functionality and things, but there's stagnicity. And the origins of a thing are being turned on their head because there's no root inside of you that runs deep enough to stabilize. That as a tree of righteousness, when the winds blow to and fro, you're standing as a cedar in Lebanon, as an oak right in the middle of the storm. And you're speaking actually to the storm saying, yeah, I see you, but my authority extends this direction and you cannot go any farther. Real authority is going to begin to manifest in the house of God in a whole new way. I heard something this week stirred in my heart so greatly. Robert Henderson was in town over at Jackie Tyre's place, Apostle Jackie Tyre, and he said something so authoritative that it blessed my soul to the very depths of it. He said that there was a man in Uganda who was a former witch, that in the midst of him being a witch, that his headquarters in another country called him and said, you need to leave the city right now. And you need to go 70 miles outside of the radius of the city. Because if you remain in the city, Morris Cirillo is coming to town and his anointing will kill you. If you remain in the city or 70 miles within the city, his anointing will actually kill you. And you cannot go back for 21 days because his anointing will linger for 21 days in the region. That if you go back, his anointing will kill you. So the man stayed outside. He obeyed, but that began to shift his mind to realize that he didn't have all power. This is the thing that, fast forward, he got sent back into the region to break up a little prayer group of this little group of women that were praying. And he's like, why am I worried about these little bitty women? And headquarters said, you need to pay attention because these little ladies are praying. And what they're praying for is going to be a 70-year revival. 70-year revival that will not leave the region if they finish and accomplish what they're asking God for. So I need you to go into the region and deal with them. This part blessed me. That when he looked in the realm of the spirit, we don't think that the, that the demonic could actually do that, right? But when they looked in the realm of the spirit, he couldn't find nothing on the women themselves. But he looked back two generations and found issues with money on one side and jealousy on the other. And he used witchcraft to work in that to break up the ecclesia. And it stopped the 70 year revival from ever happening because the women started going at each other. Hear me in this. When we start dealing with our bloodline root issues, and we start fighting with everything we got within our being, we can actually stand up and say to the enemy, when he comes, he finds none of himself in me. That no matter what kind of hex, vex, voodoo, no matter what kind of curse and incantation you try to speak, there is nothing in me that looks like you, sounds like you, that gives you a foothold concerning me. I speak as one who has the authority of God that is an oracle of the kingdom as a son. And it changes our authority. As we flip through, I want you to write down in your notes and go study it. Philippians 3, 10 through 18. 1 Corinthians 9, 26 through 27. Hmm. 
me give this to you. Romans 8, 12 through 17. <laughs> Galatians 4, 1 through 2 says, now, if, now I say that the heir is, is only an heir, though he's a child, he's only an heir, and he does not differ from a slave, though he is master of all, as long he is, as he is a child. So immaturity robs you of from your ability to actually apprehend inheritance and begin to manifest the products that are born out of that inheritance. You could be walking around actually cloaked with the mantle of your forefathers, of the mantle of the house, of the mantle of whatever your purpose is. But if you go back and you study the story, when Elisha got the mantle from Elijah, what is the first act that he did? He wrapped that thing around his arm, and he began to manifest the products of that thing. Hear me in this. Your strength and your ability to actually do soul care fortifies you for the weight of glory that you're supposed to manifest. So when you get to a moment where there is an actual mantle up for grabs, you have now the ability to handle the weight of that thing resting on you. And as soon as you get it, guess what you can start doing? Manifesting it. There are things that are on my life and the lives of others that I've seen that I know that we're not in a place yet where we're ready to fully manifest it. But the only thing that's holding you back is how you manifest sonship. When you walk in the fullness of it, this is what happens. Abraham was tried and tested. God said, I want your son. So when you begin to ascend, guess what it's going to require? Sacrifice. Amen. Before I read that, let me read 1 Peter 1, 1 through 4. To all those who have obtained like precious faith with us by righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. So that means every believer. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. That through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Verse 10, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. Oh, for so an entrance, underline that, will be made and supplied to you abundantly to, everla to the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on what? The holy mountain, a place of ascension. God is calling us to a place where he's going to challenge us in this sacrifice of what we're willing to give up. That if we will yield it, it's going to require your trust, and it's going to require the trust of the thing that you're yielding. Isaac had to trust the God and his father. When he said, Dad, we got wood, we got fire, but where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, the Lord shall provide. Okay, but God, why am I laying on this wood? We got fire, we got knife. I'm laying on wood on the altar. Wait, wait a minute. But he had to trust the God and his father. And guess what? Not say a word. How much more was that a reflection of Jesus Christ? Not saying a single word, allowing there to be this thing that came about. At the place that you will find divine provision in the high place, there will be a ram in the bush. I heard the Lord say inventions, business plans, strategy, ministry structure, ideas, technology, schematics, and blueprints are going to be released from this high place. A place of divine promises and covenant. There will be blessing, fruitfulness, victories. Your offspring will be blessed. Amen. God is going to cause there to be a place where not only you store up blessings, but he's going to allow your children's children to store up blessings. When you choose to live an ascended life, order and instruction comes from the place that you ascend. Acts 1 through 2, we find that when the disciples actually encountered Jesus on the Mount of Olives, before he left, 
When he ascended, they left and went to Jerusalem as commanded, which was another mountain. Why? Because there would be deliverance on Mount Zion. They went and what they did they do? They went into an upper room and they ascended again. And when they began to pray on one accord, before they received the Holy Spirit, there was the replacement of a vacancy that was coming in the realm of the Spirit. Why? Because Judas was dead. They got the counsel on bringing order and instruction and having Matthias become now the next apostle so that it could be the fullness of what God intended before the Spirit of God came in the earth. There will be power and authority for deliverance that will come from that place. The Holy Spirit was poured out. I want you to write down Joel 2.28 through 32. We know what Joel 2.28 talks about, the pouring out the Spirit of God upon all flesh, right? But 32, which is right after that in continuation, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved for on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance. God will give you strength and direction, war tactics and victory from the ascended place. Psalm 18, 29 through 27, I want you to read that. It talks about being able to run through a troop, leap over a wall. For God, except the Lord, who is he? Who is our rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength, makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like hinds feet, like the deer to set me in high places. He teaches my hands to war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your right hand has, has held me up. Your gentleness has made me great. You enlarge my paths under me so my feet did not slip. I have pursued my enemies and overtaken them. Neither did I turn back until they all were destroyed. See, you're not going to get in the high place now and now miss it and slip off. That scripture said he has enlarged your footsteps that your feet will not slip. Purpose is ignited in, your, in the ascended place. Also, your history is, is confronted. Peter's history had to be confronted and his purpose was ignited when he got filled with the Holy Spirit and stood up and preached the message that 3,000 souls came into the kingdom. Literally, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Psalms 15, 1 through 5 says, The Lord who shall dwell temporarily in your tabernacle. This is what I love. And it says, Who shall dwell permanently, permanently on your holy hill? He who walks and lives uprightly and blamelessly, who works rightness and justice and speaks and thinks the truth in his heart. He who does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his friend, nor takes up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who revere and worship him, who, who swears to his own hurt and does not change. Meaning that your integrity has got to be sure. Amen. He who does not put out his money for interest to ones who are of his own people. Who will not take a bribe against the innocent and who does these things, they shall never be moved. So there is a place that we can live in an ascended place in God. That we don't ever have to come down off the mountain of God, but that we commune with him. And we begin to govern from the place of this mountain. And I know you're saying, well, Pastor Samuel, what's the practical ways that you can enter in this place? Let's just begin with surrender. I know y'all get tired of me saying surrender, surrender, surrender. But hear me, it is the place that will always keep you bound to the altar. And if your heart is tied to the altar, it's always tied to the place where Jesus himself prayed for Peter. He said, Satan desires to sift you, but I have prayed for you that your faith what failed you not. That was not faith for money. It was not faith for cars. It was faith for his heart to shift in a moment of trouble back to God. Hear me in this, when you live a life where you shift at a moment's notice, your pivot game is strong. That everything, you could be running full speed and then realize, oh, wait a minute, I'm running away from God, you pivot. Oh God, I'm running away from purpose, you pivot. And you turn right back in the direction that you need to turn in order to fulfill the will of God for your life and for your purpose. Hear me in this, God is about to raise the maturity level in this house. Amen. He's about to do it. And it's going to be amazing. Why? Because we're going to see people come in that we were like, there is no hope for them. They just, they, Lord Jesus, they, they got mental issues. They got all kinds of stuff going on. And with a surrendered heart, 
You're going to see God mold and make as the master craftsman, as the potter. He's going to begin to form that thing. He's going to be working. Six months, you're going to look up. Three years, you're going to look up and be like, wait a minute. They're going to the nations in three years. Wait, God, whoa, 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 whoa. We have a close friend of ours, and it's a God thing, the way he did it. Um, but her friend connected with us, and radical testimony, saved maybe about six years. But literally, she's in an assignment right now, speaking to heads of states for both U.S. and Israel, prophesying, decreeing over them, praying for them, in strategic positions, all because what? She said yes. My question to us, what's the matter with some of us? Been in the body for four, five, six decades. <laughs> we got complacent, got stuck. And hear me, I'm all about honor. I respect those who were run before us because they paved the way that we didn't even know and understand the fight that they had to make. But my question is, is that hunger yet dead? Or does it need to be stirred again? I was blessed. I watched the video with the same Morris Cirillo we were talking about. And he said, the Lord roared in his ears that prophets don't retire. I said, whoa, wait a minute. He's 86, still traveling all over Africa, all over the U.S. And he was at a point where his leg was wide open. He had this vascular disease that was actually eating his leg from the inside out, wide open. The moment he was sitting in a wheelchair crying out to God. And the glory of God hit him. And he jumped up out the chair and ran. He, now, if you see him now, he's really, really aged. You know, he's hard for him to move around and stuff, not like he used to. But every time he gives the testimony, his tears run down his face. I watched it three times. Three different times he gave a testimony. He jumped up and he runs every single time. Why? Because the hunger is still there. The passion is still there. The heartbeat of God is still there, that I will not be denied the fullness of what you've written in my scroll and until every jot and every tittle comes to pass. As long as I got breath in my body, I'm going to fulfill the will of God all the way through and through with everything that I have. I'm going to choose to live an ascended life that the glory of God can be revealed. Everybody's standing. Hey, yes, God. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Father, I thank you for every person in this room that, Lord, you're calling us higher. That every time you speak to a people and you call them higher, there is a place that you desire to encounter. Father, moments that you will ask us questions and give us commands and hard instructions. Father, that will seem like our life is hanging in the balance, but with a yes, every single thing changes. The anointing of God begins to rush in like a mighty river, and it carries us into the next place that we're supposed to be. We thank you, Father, for giving us courage, Lord God, that even as you did to Elijah, Lord God, and you told him to go to the brook, and for the season that the brook, Lord God, fed him, where ravens came and dropped off food, but when the brook dried up, you commanded him to get up and to leave that place, for there was no more water. Father, we thank you that we will leave places, Lord God, where we've grown dry in the sense, Lord God, of our pursuit concerning you. And God, we will begin, Lord God, to pursue you that new wells of living water can begin to spring up inside of us, Lord God, as a fountain of life that we begin to pursue, Lord God, new places in you that the oil can pour. And Father, out of the place of the oil, the precious ointment of God pouring upon your people, we thank you, Lord God, that you will shake the nations with a people, Lord God, that is a nameless, faceless army. We thank you, Father, for what you're doing for your people, and you're growing us, Lord God, by your spirit, that you're bringing us into a place of maturation, Father, that we will say yes to you, Lord God. Yes, the breaking hurts. Yes, the making hurts. Yes, the process is rough, but God, our answer is yes. 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 Our answer, our answer, our answer, God. Yes to your will. Yes to your will. Hey, yes to your will. 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 
Give us courage, God. Give us courage. Give us courage. For what, Lord God, is before us, we've never seen before. What we have to grow up in fast, Lord God. Yes, Lord, you're not waiting for us any longer, but you're saying, grow up and come up higher. Come see me for what I want to pour into your life. Father, I answer, yes. Hey. For there are hospitals that must be cleared out. There are entire cities that have to be changed. There are audiences, Lord God, with men of renown. That the answer begins right now. You're looking down the road 15 years for a moment. And in this moment right here, you're preparing the person on a journey that they would meet, Lord God, a person that would actually shape the world. Be a person of influence. Father, we thank you for this moment of preparation. If you believe this, let's, I want you to pray this after me. Father, I let down every wall that has kept you out of the depths of my heart. For every place that I've allowed fear, and my flesh to keep me from seeing from your perspective the place of ascent that you're calling me to I repent right now I choose to take the scales off of my eyes and to ascend the hill of the Lord with clean hands and a pure heart I ask you to reveal to me the hindrance in my bloodline. What's holding me back from accomplishing the fullness of what you have called my people to do. I say yes to the hard task of being a redeemer for my bloodline. I didn't choose this, but you chose me. So my answer today is yes. Can I get somebody to come sing this? So the cry could come out of the hearts of God's people. Hey, 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 hey. Join in with, with this tink, with this song. Hey. If you need to come to this altar, if that needs to be your yes,
All right, hallelujah. Well, it's been a wonderful day. We're just going to transition home. We know that the Holy Spirit's been moving throughout this. It's been a, what a wonderful day. But we don't, we also want to make sure that there's just, if there's anyone in here that would like for us to pray with you to receive the Lord, anybody at all, somebody might be watching online, they might be seeing what's going on here. Or, I'm not sure that we, if we're, are we still online? Are we still live streaming, Tom? If there any, but if there's anybody in here at all that would like for us to pray with you for salvation, anybody here, this, anybody at all, okay, I just I want to make sure that we offer that opportunity. Have you been blessed today? Come on, that was a wonderful, wonderful. Thanks. Pastor Samuel for being obedient and bringing us the word of the Lord and allowing the Holy Spirit to touch our hearts, to be able to stand in for our bloodline. You know, it's a serious call, but it's what God is doing. He's calling us in a serious place with him so he can bring us to that new place. It's a place of authority, but it's a place where we can't be lukewarm. We got to move into what God is doing. Also, I want to extend an invitation. If there's anybody here that has been praying about a church home, Life Centers of Church that's on the move, as you can see. We're in the, we're in the business of equipping the saints to, to make an impact in the kingdom of God. Anybody that wants to make Life Center your church home, we've got our new members rep right over here. Anybody? All right. You all have been so patient with us. We have any altar ministers? I'm not sure if anybody needs ministry after what we just happened. But if you do, if there's an altar minister here, if there's something you didn't come down about and the Lord says, I want you to get prayer for that, I want you to get it today, the altar minister is right up here. They'll be here for you. A couple of little small announcements. Uh, the June LDP meeting has been canceled. Our next meeting is on Monday night, August the 6th. Monday night, August the 6th for that. I believe the bookstore will be open today afterwards. Don't forget to go and pick up your children. I know if you haven't already, I know that our teachers are uh, have endured today. So go and get your child quickly. And go on and enjoy this day and allow the seed that has been deposited to remain. All right, we'll be closing the building shortly after. So if you just take your fellowship right on outside and get your children, let's stand to our feet as we're dismissed today. Father, we thank you for touching us today. We thank you for the message that Pastor Samuel gave, that he brought us a message, a prophetic message. Lord, we do say yes, and we thank you for every decision that was made at this altar today, Lord, that you would seal it, that you would protect against anything the enemy would try to bring. And Lord, we thank you that it will go forth and we'll walk it out and we'll see a great change come not only in this church, but in our businesses, in our jobs, in our families. Lord, Lord, we'll see change happen, and we thank you for it, Lord, for just being with us, giving us the grace to walk out the, this call, Lord, that you have on our lives. We thank you and we praise you for it, God. We pray a blessing upon Pastor Samuel and, and as he's given out, Lord, that you would give back to him. And we thank you now as we're dismissed, we say in Jesus' name, God bless you. You are dismissed. <laughs>